apparently. Alright, hello everybody! Hi! I can't believe you got up this early to come see this. That's pretty awesome. You should probably know what I'm talking about then. So, um, Alright, before we get started, I wanted to do like a quick survey of uh, people in the audience. How many people are here to kind of learn what the heck Drupal is? They don't really know. A couple people. Okay, that's cool. How many people uh, have Drupal 7 sites today? Pretty much everybody. How many people have um, delved into Drupal 8 and have some Drupal 8 uh, stuff going on? Cool. All right, so this has kind of been the mix of the audience a couple times that I've given this talk. So the talk is actually pretty short uh, because I'm trying to hit all of those people from I don't know what Drupal is to I helped make Drupal 8 and everything in between. So I'm trying to leave everything out. A lot of time at the end for questions for people who uh, need some hand with something specific. So. Um, about me, my name is Angie. I go by WebChick everywhere online except for Gmail. I don't know who that is, but they get a lot of emails they probably don't understand. Uh, and, uh, sorry, that was loud. Uh, my role in the Drupal project is I am a core committer uh, for Drupal 8. I'm also one of the uh, Drupal product managers. So I spend time coming to camps, talking to people using Drupal in the real world as far as what their pain points are, what functionality they wish the uh, software had in out of the box. And I work with the various initiative teams to see that stuff happen, keep an eye on what our competitors are doing and that sort of stuff. So um, the talk's going to kind of go like this. I'm going to give a brief, brief overview of Drupal and what it is, why it's exciting, that kind of stuff. I'm going to talk a little bit about the history and evolution of the Drupal release cycle. Um, especially if you're new to Drupal, you might, you know, hear, see some people with like, you know, gray hair and like withered looks and stuff like that to try and put that into context for you. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about how Drupal 8 works in contrast to that and what we're planning for future versions of Drupal 8 as well as Drupal 9. And then give off some practical advice for site builders, which will be the part where I just bludgeon you in the head with links. Um, there are slides will be made available afterwards, so don't stress too much about writing stuff down. So, Drupal. I like to say that Drupal is three things. Um, one, it's an incredibly flexible framework. The reason people like Drupal is because, you know, if you use another CMS product and you want a photo gallery, you know, you might have, you know, seven different photo gallery modules to choose from and you pick the one that's the least awful and integrates okay with your site and that sort of thing. With Drupal, you build your photo gallery out of components, you know, you have an image field, you add a pager to that, uh, you add a description field where you can do stuff and then you can mix and match those fields in different views. Settle down. Um, <laughs> uh, so it makes, say, for example, uh, you know, a gallery of thumbnails on the right sidebar. You want a list of the people who most recently uploaded photos or anything that you want. You can slice and dice the data in Drupal in different ways. Um, and the same you know, uh, image that you know, helps you build a photo gallery, that image field can also help you build a, uh, you know, a, an album cover field or anything else, and then it's very consistent across the platform how it works. Uh, it's also something that traditionally has been built by developers for developers, so the APIs are incredibly flexible. Uh, you can make Drupal do anything. I really like using Drupal because I'm a fundamentally lazy person, and it allows me to learn one thing to build whatever kind of site that someone comes to me and asks for. Uh, so it's really, really powerful that way. I also like to uh, highlight the amazing community in Drupal. Uh, Drupal's got, uh, I think, 47,000 developers registered on Drupal.org, over a million users registered on Drupal.org. Uh, this is us uh, at DrupalCon Vienna just a couple of weeks ago. So uh, yeah, we, we took up that whole place. That was pretty cool. Um, and, uh, and what I really like about the community is, uh, you know, there, uh, some open source communities have um, you know, this idea that like, oh, I know something, so therefore like I'm this super awesome person and you're like this lowly trash who doesn't know this thing yet. My experience with Drupal has been, oh, you don't know about the blah blah module. Well, let me tell you about it because it's amazing. And then, you know, going on to share tips and tricks with each other. You know, people show up with Drupal, they see their Drupal friends, they give them hugs. I mean, it's like, it's a really welcoming, diverse, awesome community. And then I'd say the third thing that Drupal always strives to do is stay on the cutting edge of technology. Uh, so, you know, we, Drupal was adapting standards like RSS and things like that way before uh, that was the normal thing to do. Um, so we actively look for what the, you know, most up-to-date standards are that we should be adopting. We actively look for, you know, what, what other pieces of technology we should integrate with and this kind of thing. Um, and we always want to make sure our platform is on the cutting edge 
The uh, flip side of that is that traditionally staying on the cutting edge of technology has meant backwards compatibility breaks because we couple those two things together, which has resulted in some fun times when you're upgrading, but we'll talk about that in a minute. So an overview of Drupal 8 real quick. Drupal 8 shipped uh, two years ago, about November in 2015, with a bunch of cool features. Um, a lot of pulling things that a lot of, like just everybody uses that into core, like views, NAD references, date module, that sort of thing. Uh, so that's all just available out of the box now. Um, a lot of work on the multilingual initiative, which is amazing. That used to be, I think, 32 contributed modules that you needed to glue together in weird ways, and now it's just three things. You pick which features you want, that's it. Um, so a lot of that moving things into core and simplifying them, making them more integrated, that kind of thing. Um, we did a lot of work on the front end, HTML5 support, mobile first, all this kind of stuff. So a lot, a lot of work went into Drupal 8, and it's a really amazing release with all kinds of stuff. I asked um, on Twitter what people really liked about Drupal 8 a couple of weeks ago, and the answers were, uh, number one, people really, really liked the fact that Drupal 8 is all rewritten in object-oriented PHP, because it's, uh, it's a funny thing. When I came to Drupal, this was like in 2005, I'd come from school, because I was a Google Summer of Code student back then. And uh, in school, we got taught .NET and Java and things like that. All the, you know, classes, inheritance, blah, blah, blah. And then you get to Drupal and it's like, wait, I have to make magically named functions and naming conventions with fun? It was just like, what? So I had to unlearn all of that to learn Drupal. And now I'm like in the same boat, but the opposite. It's like, wait. What's a class again? How does this work? Anyway, so, but for people, for everybody else who did not learn PHP via Drupal, this is a really welcome move because it means that everything that you know about programming applies really well. Everything is well structured, it's well architected. You know, if you open up one individual file, it's got only the code related to the one thing that it's doing instead of this massive, you know, 3,000 lines of code. Um, so people really, really like this. It's also allowed us to do a lot more fine-grained unit testing of the platform itself. So we have something like 13,000 tests that run on every patch that's uploaded to Drupal so that we ensure that the platform stays stable and, and useful for people. Um, if you talk to front-end developers, they will say they love Twig. Twig is the new uh, templating system that we use in Drupal 8. Um, and it, it, unlike the, uh, the old version, which is PHP template, uh, a couple of big improvements over that. One is you can be an expert in HTML and CSS and don't also have to be an expert in PHP because that's kind of a unicorn skill set right there. The second thing is that it was really, really easy in PHP template to, you know, if you're just starting out especially, to not know all of the magical function names that you need to run things to in order to make your code secure. Twig automatically uh, sanitizes all of its output so it's really, really difficult to accidentally introduce an XSS vulnerability and things like that into your site. Um, forces a better separation between logic and presentation. All good things. So people love Twig. And then the other thing that site builders really love is the configuration management system. So there were ways to do this moving dev to stage to live in Drupal 7, and even in Drupal 6 to an extent. But it was sort of a hodgepodge of different approaches. Features was a popular one, but it didn't work for all things. Update hooks would work, but holy God, trying to test an update hook, and oh, that was a horrible process. So with Drupal 8, the configuration management system being built in means all modules can plug into a central uh, way of doing this and handling this problem, and it's built in out of the box with forethought right from the beginning. My personal favorite thing about Drupal 8 is that you can actually build real, actual sites out of the box now. So in the past, you know, you needed Drupal 7 to do your core, uh, plus or minus a few things in there, and then you needed at least 30 contributed modules, some as high as 200, like it all depends on your use case. Um, Drupal 8 is really powerful because you can actually build a fully featured, nice looking site just with what comes out of the box, and then add contrib for the extra things that you want on top of that. So this uh, screenshot is from the uh, Out of the Box initiative. It's one of the new Drupal 8 initiatives that's trying to make it so Drupal doesn't just show a blank page that says you don't have any content yet, because that's super welcoming. Um, in order to, you know, it communicates to people the power of what Drupal can do. So it showcases views, NAD references, the ability to do structured content, um, different theming tricks, that sort of stuff. So, um, and I would say also, like if I gave the same talk at last year's Bad Camp, I probably couldn't say quite as much, but uh, this year, in particular, in the last, say, three months or so, Drupal 8 has really started maturing to the point where you can actually 
start building real actual sites. Some people were more adventurous in doing this like two years ago, but um, a lot of the big contributed modules at this point are ported, so Path Auto's ported, Panels, um, Search API, Drupal Commerce just came out right before Vienna, so we're starting to see like the tidal wave shift where the big important modules that you need are probably either ported to Drupal 8 or very, very close. Um, and so that's really great to see. Dries also uh, did, a, or Dries didn't do a survey. He reported about this survey in his uh, Vienna keynote. This is where I just ripped off a bunch of Dries' slides, basically, you know, fundamentally lazy person. But anyway, um, the agencies are starting to shift to using Drupal 8 either only, uh, especially for new builds, or just a mixture of Drupal 7 and 8. But So that tide has started to shift as well, where you can see that not only is it just web chick talking like, ooh, I'm supposed to talk about Drupal 8 and how great it is, but it's actually borne out by the real world that people are actually using this to build cool things. Here are some of the cool things that are out there that are built on Drupal 8. One of my personal favorites is uh, the YMCA is an organization that basically helps at-risk youth and you know, families to uh, you know, live better, healthier lives. And it's awesome to hear them talk about how they've managed to take you know, the work that they've done on their Drupal distribution and suddenly that, that level, that power that's in Drupal, the flexibility is accessible to everyone from a you know, huge major metropolitan city to a very small rural city. It equalizes access technology across the board. And every dollar that they save on IT costs means that they can put that dollar directly into helping young kids. So that's pretty awesome. All right, so enough blah de blah about Drupal 8. Let's talk about <clears throat> a history of Drupal release management. Um, trigger warning, because a lot of us have been through this and it wasn't very fun. Okay, so uh, this is a, uh, this is a, like a map that's sort of to scale of the different release cycles and how they went. So it used to be in the past, say Drupal 4, Drupal 5, all those kinds of things, where we would put out a new release approximately once a year. It was always a, when it's ready, we're going to put it out, but about once a year is when that would happen. So we put out Drupal 5, I think Drupal 4.7 came out in February 2006, Drupal 5 was January of 2007, Drupal 6 was February 2008, so you, you know, about a year uh, every time. Uh, and each one of those would have this philosophy of we'll break your code, not your data. What that meant is that we could evolve the APIs to be more modern, we could insert new best practices ways of doing things, but we would provide an upgrade path to ensure that your nodes and users and taxonomy terms and that kind of thing would make the change over. So we were doing about once a year for a while there. In Drupal 7, uh, we decided we wanted to put a lot more time into making this thing you know, really click. So we did a lot of big, ambitious things in Drupal 7, like multilingual, like the D7UX initiative, which modernized the admin interface, uh, the new database abstraction layer, automated tests, lots of different things in Drupal 7. But you can see as a result, our development cycle went from about a year to more like three years. Um, and so everybody on Drupal 6 had to sit there and wait until Drupal 7 came out to get new core features. So that took a long time. In Drupal 8, we got even more ambitious, put views in core, web services, you know, re rewrote the whole theming system, used Twig, and on and on and on. That took even longer, so we were at more like a four and a half year development cycle for that. So again, people using Drupal 7 were still stuck on whatever stupid version of jQuery came out on January of 2011, which is not remotely supported before. So, this wasn't really fun uh, because people couldn't plan around this. Um, you know, site builders didn't know when to plan for a new release. Uh, core developers certainly didn't know when to plan for a new release. You'd have this heartbreaking situation where someone would be super gung ho to work on a feature for core, and you're like, "Yeah, you're gonna have to wait at least two years to we get done stabilizing this to do that." And of course, you know, we lose a lot of really great contributors that way. Um, also, coupling backwards compatibility uh, breaks with innovation means that we couldn't innovate in core at all. So essentially, core would become this kind of crusty snapshot in time of how the web worked back then, and then you would use contrib to overlay on top of that to deal with it. So you'd use like the jQuery update module, for example, and things like this. Um, and then that, that whole pros prospect of a harrowing upgrade path uh, meant people would often stay on, say, Drupal 5 until Drupal 7 came out because then, you know, they would act, at least have to minimize that, you know, pain less often. But the um, flip side of that is if you wait two releases to do a migration, not only are you dealing with the code changes between 5 and 6 and 7, 
but also the approach you take to solving problems, like what's the best way to do image galleries or whatever, completely changes between those two versions. So you not only need to rewrite the code, but you also need to rethink the whole approach. So that's not an optimal solution. So in Drupal 8, we do this instead. Every six months, uh, there's what's called a minor release of Drupal. Uh, and a minor release of Drupal is a fancy semantic versioning word, but it just means we increment that middle number by one. So 8.1.0, 8.2.0, 8.3.0, and so on. Uh, the advantage of this is that each one of those point releases is an opportunity for us to ship new features and functionality, new APIs that didn't exist before, bug fixes, cleanups, and all that kind of stuff. But we do that without breaking backwards compatibility. So we keep the same old APIs that used to be in there. We mark them deprecated. We advise people to get off of them you know, whenever they can, but your code won't break in the same way that a major version from a 7 to 8 or a 6 to 7 would have broken in the past. Um, and the great thing about this is that it all happens with backwards compatibility. So we no longer couple, let's ship new features with let's break all of your stuff. <laughs> we just ship new features and don't break your stuff. So that's kind of a nice thing. Um, the other thing that we're doing with Drupal 8 uh, is uh, introducing this concept of a long-term support release. So this is an example, like don't fixate on the graph too much here, but what it's saying is um, that we're going to keep developing these minor releases of Drupal 8 effectively until we can't anymore. Uh, at that point we'll branch a Drupal 9 and that would mean that the last eight point release that came out after that, or sorry, minor release that came out after that will go into LTS mode. And that means that we don't add new features to eight anymore. What we do instead is we treat it effectively like Drupal 7 is today, where we just give it, you know, bug fixes, you know, critical issues, security fixes, all that kind of stuff, but we're not actively developing new features against Drupal 8 anymore. That would now happen against Drupal 9. Um, so this is really helpful for organizations that want to set up a site and forget it. Um, as long as you move to the LTS version of Drupal 8, you should be fine for until Drupal 10 comes out. Goodness knows when that's going to be. Um, another big improvement we've done release management-wise is uh, we've introduced the concept of experimental modules. So this allows us to say we know that we want to ship, say, workbench type functionality in core. We know we want to ship the ability to make posts as drafts. We don't know exactly what that looks like. We're going to get that functionality out there so people can test it and use it. We can get feedback from the field on how that works. Um, and then over time, shift these things from alpha to beta to stable. And then they do get promoted to a stable you know, feature just like the rest of core. So for example, the big pipe module, uh, which allows uh, rendering like the main portion of the page prior to the sidebar blocks and stuff flitting in. So it's a good performance uh, improvement. That started out as an experimental module and then over time became stable and now that's something that's just out of the box in core and there's, a, if, uh, there's an issue for 8.5 to actually just turn it on by default so everybody gets to benefit from it. So, um, so I like this a lot because this allows us to not, you know, uh, otherwise the, the alternative to this is like, oh you want, you know, that functionality? Well there's 37 modules that do that. Go have fun trying to pick which one is the right one. We tell you in advance, this is how core is going to look and we give you the opportunity to preview it um, as we work on stabilizing it. So. so there are numerous benefits to all of these different steps we've taken. Um, a predictable release cycle means that both end users and core developers can plan and organize around these. So I can tell you right now today that 8.5 will be out on March 7th and 8.6 will be out on October 5th. I could tell you that with more authority if I were sitting in front of the dates. But anyway, the point is, you know now, a year in advance, when you need to plan for these minor updates to happen. And that is unprecedented. And the cool thing is, we've managed to ship four of these point releases now, uh, minor releases now, and every single one of them came out when we said they would. What? So yeah, so we're really excited about this. Um, yeah, right? That's really good, right? Yep, and so uh, that, that minor release cycle also allows us to you know, update the versions of jQuery and stuff like that and, and various other things so people aren't stuck in this frozen past. Uh, so in general, this is a really, really good direction that we've gone in. And then the really exciting thing is that when you talk about Drupal 9, Drupal 9 is just going to be another one of these minor releases. So, you know, you can see as we ship minor releases of Drupal 8, we keep these, you know, like backwards compatibility deprecated systems in there. Eventually, we're going to like stranglehold ourselves with like, okay, it's really literally not possible to add more stuff to Drupal without breaking backwards compatibility. What will happen at that point then is the LTS version of Drupal 8 will just be the, you know, the final version that had all the deprecated APIs marked. Um, and then Drupal 9 will just be Drupal 
10 with those things cut out. Um, and that's really exciting because it means a couple of things. It means if you're keeping up with these six month release cycles, your migration from Drupal 8 to 9 is nothing at all. Um, and we are, in fact, one of the things that's blocking opening the Drupal 9 release branch is the ability to, for a module to be used on multiple major versions at the same time. Because previously we'd had no reason to support that, but going forward we will. Uh, so that's really exciting. So some of the prerequisites to opening Drupal 9 uh, is, you know, we want to be able to, um, we want to be able to run tests against both major branches at once. We want the ability to turn modules on against mo both major versions at once. Uh, there's some other stuff in there. We want to make sure Drupal 8 isn't using any deprecated APIs itself, um, because if it is, we don't want to drag that baggage forward to Drupal 9, so that's a blocker for it. There's several blockers, so if you're kind of concerned about Drupal 9 coming out and, oh my god, what am I going to do? Don't worry, it's not coming out anytime soon, you're good. Um, and when it does come out, we will give at least a six month, if not a 12 month, advanced release notice uh, that that's going to happen. So we'll know in advance that this version of Drupal 8 is going to be the last version of Drupal 8, so it's the LTS release, and then you'll know that once that comes out, you have six months before Drupal 9 will ship and drop on you. So um, trying as much as possible to give everybody enough window, but again, in theory, moving from 8.10 to 9, it should be no more harrowing than moving from 8.8 .8 to 8.9 or any of the other ones. So. so how do we put some of this stuff into practice? Um, so. I'm bringing this up only because this is a new thing for new, I mean two years, but a relatively new thing for Drupal and so a lot of people don't really know how to handle this yet in their organizations because they're used to the old model which is I download Drupal 7 and it sits there like a lump on a log for as long as it needs to and I never need to worry about it again. Um, so I just want to talk about that a little bit here. So. Um, know the release schedule. So there's a page here at Drupal.org core release cycle overview that has all of the dates uh, that are important and that you need to know. Um, in particular, I would pay attention to when the alpha date is of the next release because that is essentially feature freeze. That's when we cut off development of new features and functionality. There are sometimes a couple of things that slip in between alpha and beta. You know, if they're really close and they're very exciting, we might make exceptions for those kind of on a case-by-case -case basis, but more or less, uh, by the time we get to alpha, we should know pretty well uh, what's going to be in there and what you need to worry about. Um, so alpha is a great time, if you're not keeping up with the day-to-day -day development of Drupal 8, to set up a dev environment, download the alpha version, run all your tests, make sure that your site's working properly with it, because if it's not, we have a good month and a half to two months to fix whatever comes up. Uh, when is a less optimal time to do that is at RC or after Drupal 8.x comes out, which is oftentimes what a lot of people do, because at that point it's too late for us to fix it, you know, and then we just have to kind of band-aid around it, which is not ideal. And then, of course, the actual release date, that's when you're going to want to move, because what happens uh, is when a uh, new version of Drupal 8 comes out, so 8.3, for example, comes out, or 8.4, that will mean the end of support for the previous version. So there's only one minor release of Drupal 8 supported at a time. Um, it's not instantly cut off. You have about a month window to move uh, before a security release might come out that you know we would publicly disclose and not fix in the previous branch. Uh, but you do need to be cognizant of the fact that you know now that 8.4 is out as of a couple of weeks ago, that is the version you should be using. You don't want to be sticking around on 8.2 because things won't be developed for 8.2 anymore. Security patches won't go up for 8.2 and so on. The nice thing about this graph that I really like, though, is the fact that the development cycle, the part where you add new features and, and this kind of thing, that never actually stops. We're always open for development against the next minor release. And so if you're somebody who has a, you know, awesome idea for core, it doesn't matter what stage in the release cycle the stable branch is in, you can go ahead and make a change and do whatever you like. So that's really awesome. Secondly, um, if you want a little bit more heads up of what's coming down the pipe, and you're a developer in particular, this is a really good uh, listing page to follow. There's a RSS feed of this, there's also a Twitter account you can follow for this. So anytime that we commit a change to Drupal 8 that will affect site builders or developers in some way, uh, one of the prerequisites to committing that patch is, is to make one of these API change record things. And so this will give you a really good synopsis and you'll know instantly right after something was committed that, oh, we did something that, for example, messed up Drush. That was something that happened in 8.4. Uh, so that you could be aware of that immediately in the moment, even before alpha, you know, if you want advanced, advanced notice. 
Another place that we post uh, kind of major announcements like that is uh, groups.drupal.org slash core. So this is more like human readable things rather than, uh, you know, like this API team to this API. Um, so this is where we'll post things like a new release is scheduled for this day, or hey, we're looking for feedback around how many people actually use this thing, or whatever it is. So this is a really good thing to subscribe to. This is kind of where the core development team communicates out to the public uh, for better feedback and that kind of thing. It's also important when you're using Drupal 8 to understand what backwards compatibility actually means, because it does not mean, as it did in Drupal 7, that it's frozen in ice and we don't change anything. What it does mean is that if you're using the recommended public APIs for things, you should be fine. But if you're doing things that are kind of unorthodox, you might run into problems. So like one example is um, database table names could change between 8.4 and 8.5. That's technically a backwards compatibility change. However, if you're using the like entity access APIs and all that kind of stuff, you won't be affected by that at all. However, if you're doing a manual SQL query against some table against the best wishes of the Drupal core team, then you could run into problems. Which is why when these minor releases come up, it is it behooves you to pay attention to uh, the release notes, which we spend a lot of time on, uh, that would itemize any gotchas that you might run into when you're doing the, uh, the updates and that kind of stuff. So please read those. They spend a lot of time on those, making sure that the, uh, the really important stuff is bottled up that you might need to know or you might be um, affected by. It's also good to keep an eye on what we're planning uh, in the roadmap. There's actually a page here at roadmap. What? I know. Um, and uh, this is new. All these things are new, you know? It's like planning for stuff. Whoa, it's very new and, and interesting. Um, so these are all examples of the uh, new Drupal 8 initiatives that we have going on. And this is for Drupal 8.5, 8.6, and on like that. M many of these are multi-release initiatives because they're not simple things. But for example, stabilizing the migration path is a huge priority for 8.5. Uh, particularly for seven to eight migrations, because in Drupal 6, we, we prioritize Drupal 6 to 8 migrations because, you know, people on Drupal 6 were kind of SOL when Drupal 8 came out. Okay. I don't need... There we go. <laughs> uh, and so, uh, yeah. So we prioritize the 6 to 8 migrations because those people needed it a lot more. People on Drupal 7 that are happy with the Drupal 7 sites can stay there. That's fine. But uh, Drupal 6 got end of life when Drupal 8 came out or shortly thereafter. So we want to make sure those people were taken care of. Um, so the 7 to 8 migration path still works for the major things, but you might run into edge cases and stuff. So we want to try and get that all stable, nice, uh, no more issues with that. Media is a big initiative as well. We got the media entity module effectively in core for Drupal 8.4, which is huge. But now we want to build some user-facing functionality on top of that, and we want to make it so that media is kind of a canonical <clears throat> way to do images and videos and all that kind of stuff, rather than having a mixture of approaches in core. Layout, the layout team is amazing. They are doing this uh, sections-based layout so system. So like <clears throat> in Drupal uh, 7, you know, if you use panels, you it was kind of like for the whole content area. And so you'd have to say, OK, um, I need to make 47 different layouts, because one of them needs to have sidebar at the top and two columns and a sidebar at the bottom or whatever. Uh, the way that this UI works is it does it on a per row basis. So you say, I want a new section, boop, and then you say, I want this section to have one column. I want a new section here, that's two columns. I want a section here, that's three columns, or, or whatever, however you want to lay it out. And then you take blocks and you can position them inside, drag and drop them, that kind of thing. And because blocks in Drupal 8 are content entities, you can actually <laughs> add layouts and blocks to your blocks and put your blocks in your layouts. Whoa! Anyway, it's pretty cool. Um, but I really like this because it's kind of a product differentiating feature. It's not, uh, it's not like a, yeah, okay, it's like a little stupid layout system or whatever. It's actually something that's really awesome and very powerful and was validated by real people building real sites with Drupal 8. Um, and it was led in a design first manner, so it's really cool. Uh, API first, that's the idea of getting Drupal really nicely working with JavaScript frameworks or mobile applications or this kind of thing. The ability to use Drupal as a, uh, as a content store, talking out to custom front ends, or vice versa, the ability to uh, pull in and ingest content from other external data sources, so both of those approaches. Workflow is, uh, the workflow initiative is planning a, a module called Workspaces to go into core, and this is effectively a content staging effort. So we have the ability to preview things in core and put things in draft mode in core, but often you want more than just like one node's worth of context and that kind of thing. So for example, 
let's say you want to build a version of the homepage if, uh, say, the Republicans retain the House in 2018, and you want to build a version of your homepage if the Democrats take the, the uh, House in 2018, right? So those are very different homepages, right? In one, you're going to have like a picture of Trump crying, right? And in the other one, you're going to have a picture of Hillary Clinton crying or whatever. You know what I mean? They're all going to be different, and you're going to highlight different stories and that kind of thing. Workspaces allows you to take chunks of content, nodes, blocks, menus, anything like that, and, and look and <coughs> arrange them uh, on a per environment basis. You can set up an environment that's like dev stage live. You can set up an environment that's, you know, 2018 Democrats versus 2018 Republicans or whatever you want, and then you can deploy that workspace to your production workspace, and it works really slick like that. So that's the hope for 8.5 is to get that module into core, probably as experimental at first. Outside in is a nice user-facing uh, functionality. This is the idea that you don't have to be an expert in how Drupal core developers decided to organize the information architecture of Drupal. Instead, you're like, I want to change that thing on my page specifically. You click on it, and then you can change it in the sidebar. Out of the box, I showed earlier, that's the idea of making Drupal a showcase of what Drupal can do. Uh, example content, really nice design out of the box that fits the example content and showcasing a lot of the features that come out of core. We are uh, now as a Vienna two additional initiatives. We're trying to pick a JavaScript framework, not for Drupal as a whole, uh, because Drupal as a whole, we want to retain uh, like neutrality there. We want people to be able to use whatever JavaScript framework they want to use to ingest content from Drupal. But for our admin interface, we would really like to stop the click, wait, round trip, come back, you know, very clunky, kind of party like it's 1999 UIs. Um, <laughs> So we'd like to do something more responsive and flashy and that kind of thing. So we're currently in the throes of evaluating React versus Vue versus web components versus web components with Polymer versus Elm. There might even be another one. But people are actively in the, in the throes of, you know, setting these up side by side, comparing and contrasting the size of communities, you know, what resources are available to help people learn it and these kinds of things to see what's going to work best for us. Um, and then another initiative that I'm really excited about is the idea of doing automated upgrades, starting with security updates of core, because um, I, I don't know how many people were around for um, SA005, which was a big database uh, SQL injection error that uh, happened back in 2016 or 2015, it's a couple years ago. But it was like one of those things where the SA went out and said, hey, there's this huge problem, you really should update. And then within about 12 hours, there were bots actively exploiting this. So we want to be able to get everybody uh, instantly moved to the next stable, uh, secure version of Drupal without them having to do manual intervention. Because otherwise, it really depends on if you were sleeping or not when that SA came out, how protected you were, and we want to avoid that. Um, but that's a really exciting thing because a lot of people, uh, one of their criticisms of Drupal is that it is difficult to upgrade from one version to another, uh, even just point releases, as opposed to something like WordPress that, you know, it's just like one click and it's done. So, uh, those are all the things we have planned for 8.5 and beyond. Really exciting stuff in there, but I want to highlight that these things don't happen without help. Um, there is no, you know, Drupal company that's behind Drupal and just pays people to do Drupal things and then waits around for people to request stuff and then they fit it into a backlog or whatever. Like, Drupal's not a product run that way. Drupal is an open source project. There are many, many, many people who work on it. They all work on it for their own intrinsic motivations, whether that's because they find it fun and interesting. That's some people's motivation. Sometimes their boss is paying them to care about a problem, so that's another motivation. Uh, sometimes they've hit this problem themselves and they don't ever want to hit it again, so they're solving it because it, you know, it's kind of a selfish, not selfish, but like a self-driven reason. Many, many reasons people contribute, but they don't get told from on high what to work on. From on high, the best we can hope for is be like, look at this, wouldn't it be cool if we had this? Anyone want to work on it? Ah, you know, like that's about what we can do. So I just want to highlight that because what I don't want people to do is go to the core roadmap page and say, well, that's definitely coming out in 8.5, so I'm going to plan for it because there's a lot of things that need to happen and line up for those things to happen. So the roadmap is attempt to preview what we think will happen. That's after talking to all the initiative teams, finding out what they think they can do, uh, putting that against our past uh, experience with like, maybe you can't do 35 things. Let's try three. Let's start with those and stuff like that. So we'll see. 
Um, so if you want to get involved, though, the Cord Roadmap page has a bunch of links to all of the main issues where this stuff is happening. So you can subscribe to those issues if you want to be, keep progressive updates. That's where the latest patches will be. That's where all the current discussion will be and that sort of thing. Particularly if you have real world uh, in the field experience with any of this stuff, it's really helpful information to know. Um, because oftentimes core developers are sort of debating back and forth about this, that, or the other thing. And it's really helpful to have a third party come in and say, well, we've actually used this patch in production for six months and it's worked fine for us. That's, that's actually awesome. And then the other thing, if this comes back, I would like to highlight, it's just a okay, is that when I say get involved, I don't mean just code. There's actually numerous ways to get involved that have nothing to do with writing code. So uh, things like testing a patch in IE, whoa, that's like a huge contribution because <laughs> none of us use that. Um, user experience testing, uh, doing accessibility reviews, uh, doing things like planning events, you know, that people can get together and work in, you know, those are huge contributions that you can make and many, many others. So. Uh, what if I'm still on Drupal 7? <laughs> and I would say, honestly, if you're still on Drupal 7 and it's working fine for you, that is fine. You won't have to upgrade Drupal 7 until Drupal 9 comes out. However, I would say that because, the, again, the aim, we'll see how this actually plays out in practice, but definitely the aim of the core development team, the release managers, everyone else, is for Drupal 9 to effectively be just another Drupal 8 point release in terms of, or sorry, minor release in terms of difficulty. The sooner you can get on Drupal 8, the better. But do it when it makes sense for your organization. So one, one example why it might make sense for your organization is I'm developing a totally new you know, um, uh, product for our company and it's gonna have you know, many, many different you know, sub-sites and all this kind of stuff. Building that on Drupal 8 would be really beneficial because then you don't have to do a seven to eight migration at some point for that thing. You can start on the version that everybody is moving to from the get-go. So that's a really good reason. Another good reason might be, um, you know, my Drupal 7 site is working fine, but this new functionality that shipped in Drupal 8 core is gonna revolutionize the way we do everything. So we wanna move to Drupal 8 for that reason. That's a great reason to move to Drupal 8. But I wouldn't move to Drupal 8 just because. There should be a, an actual business reason to do it, but I would caution against waiting until Drupal 9 just because, you know, if you look at the best practices in Drupal 5, uh, Drupal 7 was nothing like that. And it really took a, like, a lot of the pain that was involved in that upgrade path was not just you know, this function name changing that function name, but it was, okay, now instead of using a gallery module, you have to build out your content types with relations to each other and this kind of thing. So the sooner you jump on Drupal 8 and adopting the best practices that are modern today, the better off you're gonna be in the long run. If you are looking at upgrading to Drupal 8, this is a useful tool. This is the uh, contrib tracker issue. So every module that someone cared enough about to make an issue about is here. And uh, it will have a different status depending on how ported it is. So active means it hasn't been ported at all. Needs work means there's a dev release of some kind, but it's not stable yet. Uh, needs review means there's something available to, for testing. RTBC is need, uh, it's like a release candidate. It's almost ready and fixed means it's done. Uh, and these will correlate to a little message on the project page that tells you how done something is. So if you care about, for example, the feeds module or the rules module or something like that, you can subscribe to the issue on this queue uh, and you can find out how you yourself can contribute either financially, developer time, whatever it is to seeing those things happen. Um, and then the other thing I would recommend is just setting up a dev site uh, in Drupal 8 and trying the migration path out and seeing what works for you and what doesn't. Because right now, we have a lot of focus on making that migration path stable. So we've got tons of people working on that. Core committers, it's at like the top of their queue when they're committing patches and stuff like that. So if you're running into problems with the migration path, it would be really great to jump in and tell us about it now. So in closing, this is super cheesy because I got, you know, this over there. Don't delay, try Drupal 8 today. Wah, wah, wah. <laughs> I know, I know, I'm sorry. I needed, you know, you need more cheese, so I figured it out. Um, so these are three great resources. The, the first one is just a general overview, kind of a marketing one-pager thing on like what Drupal 8 does. So if you're trying to sell your boss on adopting Drupal 8, you can use that. The second one is actually amazing. It is a documentation that's curated by the documentation team and it's written around a, kind of a practical example of building out a farmer's market website. So if you're uh, new to Drupal 8 or new to Drupal in general, this is a really good resource because instead of just talking 
you know, at a noun level, like this is a node, blah, blah, blah. It actually shows you how to put these uh, concepts in practice. And uh, because it's written in ASCII doc, it's actually translated into multiple languages. So I think Hungarian is there, Hindi maybe, anyway, several different languages. So that's really awesome as well. And then the last one I'd update uh, or alert people to, which is an oldie, it's api.drupal.org. Most developers know of this resource already. But what you might not know is in Drupal 8, in addition to like the function references and this kind of stuff, the, the main landing page of api.drupal.org has a bunch of like general concept overview pages that are really good. So they talk about things like what is object-oriented programming? Uh, what is a service? You know, why would I use it? These kinds of things. How does the plugin system work? Um, that are actually really useful for providing that overview information um, when you're getting started and you want to, you know, delve into the APIs more. So, so that is what I've got. Questions? Whoa, hands. Okay, uh, I saw you in the pink shirt first. So let's say I'm lazy and I, uh, I'm on 8.2 and, and I decided I'm going to upgrade to 8.4. What does the upgrade path at that point? Do you want an 8.3 upgrade and an 8.4 upgrade, or can I go directly to a uh, uh, Okay, so the question was, if I'm still on 8.2, I'm not going to make a character judgment, so if I'm still on 8.2 uh, and I want to move to 8.4, is it better to move from 8.2 to 8.3 to 8.4, or should I move directly from 8.2 to 8.4? Um, in theory, you should be able to just move to, straight to 8.4 because the update functions in 8.3 are still going to be there, so it should just run the whole thing for you. Um, it makes me a little nervous to do that. Like I like to do as minimal change as possible because if, a, if something is introduced and it does break something on your site, now you have two possible sources. Was it the 8.3 updates or the 8.4 updates? So I personally would do one at a time, baby step it a little bit, just because I've been bitten many times by changing too many things at once and then having a whole process of doing that. But, um, but in theory, you should be able to move straight to 8.4 because uh, the 8.4 update functions that run during the uh, upgrade process, those are still there um, through the, for the entirety of the Drupal 8 release cycle. So, yeah. And then I saw, I saw you, but there was like, one other hand. Yes, in the black t-shirt. Um, it's a little specific, but uh, I was looking at the, um, at the task that's being implemented in the roadmap. I don't see anything about uh, date range, and I, I, I heard that it does have a stable release, but I Yep. So the question was, um, uh, uh, there's nothing in the roadmap about date range, uh, but that is something that we've been working on in core. And the question was, does that mean core has support for recurring events? And yes. Uh, that does mean that. Date range was one of the modules that actually made it from, they graduated from experimental to stable in 8.4, which is why it's not in the roadmap, because it's, it's, I wouldn't say it's done, there's still more, you know, you can always make modules better, but in terms of it has a stable API, we don't expect it to break anymore, it's feature complete, that kind of thing, that is in core. Now, I haven't used it myself, so I can't really attest to um, how easy it is to use or this kind of thing, but I do know that that's exactly why that's in core, is because we know that recurring events are a use case that a lot of people have. So yeah, try 8.4 and hopefully it will work great. So, yeah, Rick. Are module developers encouraged to use a point release system so that you can tell if they fixed applications from like 8.4 to 8.5? So the question was, are module developers encouraged to use a point release system so that you can tell if something's changed from, uh, or included all the fixes from 8.4 and 8.5? I would say I'm not aware of that being a recommended practice. There's a couple of issues with that. One is that uh, Drupal, uh, or Drupal Contrib does not use the semantic versioning thing. There's an open issue with like 700 comments to try and make it that way, but it's not yet there. So uh, modules in Contrib tend to be, so while you could incorporate a thing like that, like say I'm gonna make a, you know, a 8.5 version of my module in 8.6, uh, that definitely is not standard throughout. The modules tend to be um, maintained on, the, on a minor release that reflects their own development. So Commerce, for example, is a 2.x version, even though um, it works fine against 8.5. Five, as far as I know. Um, one thing you can do though, if you say for example, say for example 8.4 came out with a new media API. 
and you want to use that in your media module. You can set a minimum core requirement in your module of 8.4 to ensure that users don't accidentally install it against 8.3 and get a whole bucket loads of errors. So that's something you can do as a module developer, but um, otherwise, yeah, that doesn't tend to be uh, something that you can uh, communicate at least through version numbers currently. Uh, so I'd use the project page for that or, or other mechanisms. So. I saw hands, maybe. Mark. So we know the release dates for 8.5 and 8.6. And you know, it seems like, I don't know how far we'll get with layout and media and workflow and those other initiatives, but then maybe it takes 8.7, 8.8 to get, get those done. But do you have a guess as to how many minor releases before we get to? Before we get to nine, okay. So the, the question was, um, do I have a guess of how many minor releases before we get to nine? I don't, but here, let me, let me bring up this issue. Do, do. Oh wait, I need to mirror my displays, don't I? One sec. Otherwise it'll look great on my screen, but no one else will see anything. I learned that the hard way the other day. Okay. Uh, what? Mm -hmm. What's happening here, guys? There, that's the mess I'm used to. Okay. Um, not that. That's just depressing. <laughs> That's the, uh, that's the page I always go to to see if internet is working or not, because it's short to type and it doesn't have HTTPS. Da, 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 where did you go? This, yeah. So this issue here is a, a good reality check of uh, when we're gonna actually see this stuff happen, because there's a lot in here. Um, so these are the prerequisites to opening Drupal 9. Uh, so we have to have a stable migration path. That's pretty obvious and straightforward. The goal is to have a stable migration path by 8.5. We'll see though, because it was also a goal to have a stable migration path by 8.4. And that didn't quite happen like that, so. Um, they need the ability to move in the migration system from eight to eight, in addition to seven or six to eight, so that we can move from eight to nine, because nine, again, is gonna effectively just be an eight release, just a little bit fancier version. Um, we need to change the compatibility system so that it allows a module to be installed on multiple major versions of core. Right now you have to specify your info file, core equals 8.x. So that means you need to specify core equals 9.x, even if the same module would work in different places. Um, we have to make sure core is not using any deprecated classes itself. There are people working on this, but it's slow going and there's a lot there. Because when Drupal 8 shipped, it was still in that kind of midway state where we were kind of like, look, we just gotta get this thing out there in front of people. Even if, you know, common.inc is still kind of a mess of procedural functions. So that's a huge undertaking that people haven't started yet. Um, we need uh, contrib modules to be able to, oh, right, this is a, a big thing. Uh, backing this up by automated testing, which people are working on right now. So the ability to say, hey, you, you're using a deprecated API and warning people about that. I actually saw this great tweet by some person who was like, the way they deprecated an API in their software was they added a sleep eight to all function calls of that thing. And what that means is that every time you use the deprecated API, your application would stop for eight seconds, and then you complain like, why is my application so slow? It says, because you're using that function, you know? So I don't know that we're gonna do that, but, <laughs> but I just thought that was funny. It's a very user-facing uh, you know, reason. If your customers are yelling at you, you will probably change your thing. Um, but at any rate, we wanna make sure that it's possible uh, to know as we're updating a patch that it's like, nope, don't commit that because it introduces another deprecation warning and stuff like that. So anyway, this list goes on. There's a lot there. Uh, and so I would say we're probably at least, God, I'm on tape. Um, I'm gonna say it's probably two years out at minimum is what I'm thinking, just being realistic about it, that in, unless somebody comes along, and, and also we need a good reason to stop doing development on Drupal 8 ourselves, and right now we haven't hit that yet. And we managed to do some pretty major awesome things in Drupal 8 uh, in the, even just the last two years without affecting uh, websites and stuff like that. So I. I don't know, I think it's gonna be a while. The one thing that might drive it to happen faster is Symphony 4 
um, I don't think it's going to be possible for us to move to Symphony 4 and Drupal 8 because that would break a lot of stuff. Um, so Symphony 4 might be the triggering point for when we need to move to Drupal 9 or something like that. But again, all of these things need to be done prior to that. So if you want Drupal 9 to come out sooner, I guess work on those things. If you don't want Drupal 9 to come out sooner, then try to stop those. No, I'm just kidding. Don't do that. <laughs> um, but yeah, there's, there's a bucket loads of things. So I'm, I'm pretty sure in October of 2017, I'm pretty sure that you're good on Drupal's, uh, Drupal 8 for at least another two years before we do LTS. Which is nice because then it's like, it's again a four year release cycle, but the difference is that you got feature release every six months and, you know, still got the, the long release cycle that you're used to. So, other questions? Random facts? I can also answer questions about Drupal community stuff, Drupal association stuff, sort of. I haven't served on those things in a while, but. I have a question. Uh, uh, now, one of the things that's actually, I, I, as a webmaster, I want Drupal. I want to be able to move to Drupal eight because of the uh, import and export configuration mm -hmm. uh, that that features is going to be involved with that. But uh, we're waiting. We're still waiting on modules, and I guess the point we're saying the module situation. Uh, one thing, uh, a slightly different topic would be the matter of, uh, and this is in reference to a post you made recently on uh, the redirect module and uh, the fact that it was in offer or something like that, but it's highly used. Uh, in terms of what the uh, security team requires in order to make module considered stable. Mm -hmm. I, I'm wondering, uh, in Drupal 7, I noticed right now the workbench moderation is considered stable even though it's dependent on uh, drafty, which is an alpha. Mm -hmm. And I was just wondering why the uh, team might consider uh, things to be stable even though they're dependent on unstable like other <laughs> yeah, that's, a, that's an interesting conundrum. Okay, so the question is, um, lately, as of in the last three or four months or something, uh, if you go to a project page on Drupal.org, you will see uh, this little shield icon, which indicates that this module is um, covered by the Drupal security team. And what that means is the Drupal security team uh, is committed to uh, releasing security advisories about this thing. They are committed to working with committer, uh, with the maintainers of the module to getting security fixes out in a timely manner through the standard channels. Um, and one of their prerequisites, the security team, is that it must have a stable release, meaning it's not of alpha, beta, that kind of thing. And also that uh, the project maintainer has opted in to security coverage, which means they've agreed to various conditions, which means like, you're going to respond to the security team when they talk to you, and you're going to get your fix out within a certain period of time, and various other things. It's like a terms of use kind of thing, agreement. So, um, so the question was, this is a little funny because this module, Workbench Moderation, is marked stable, but it depends on this module, Drafty, which is marked beta and does not have a little special shield icon. So how do we deal with that? Um, and I think the answer is, the security team doesn't enforce a lot of policing about this as long as the maintainer themselves who set that shield icon agrees to following the security team's best practices and stuff like that, that they are, um, you know, they kind of leave it in the maintainer's hands to make smart decisions about this. You'll see this too with like certain distributions, especially Drupal 8 distributions like Thunder, I think, and Lightning and uh, Open Publish and some other ones have stable releases for their versions, even though the sub modules may or may not be stable themselves. Um, I think it would depend on the, whenever there's a security issue, it's reported privately at first, and then the security team goes through a kind of a discussion process as far as what they should do about that issue. So the default is if a module is not supported by the security team, and it only has like 30 users or something, it's like just put it in the public queue because it'll get solved a lot faster that way. It won't be held up on us. Um, and you know, very few, there's very minimal risk to anyone you know, seeing it in there. But 
I think in a situation like this, where this module you know, has 13,000 sites that are using it, and it's known to be a dependency of a module like Workbench Moderation, which has you know, 30,000 sites, I really think in that case, they would probably special case it, and they would probably handle it privately, even though it has uh, you know, big, bigger implications. But you bring up a good point that when you're adopting uh, you know, different modules, it does pay to look under the hood a bit and find out what they're pulling in as dependencies. Not only Drupal modules, but also in the world of Composer and blah, 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 they could be pulling in external PHP libraries that are not necessarily the latest and this kind of thing. So it is really smart for you as a site builder to know all the code that's actually installed on your site and what the current state of it is. Um, but to answer your question, the security team plays a more facilitating role, so they don't actually get mired in the muck of like micromanaging this kind of thing. Uh, they're trusting the maintainers to make good decisions based on what they're able to, to bring to the table. So hopefully, if that maintainer used Drafty as a dependency, that means they're familiar with what Drafty does, and if a security issue should ever come up for Drafty, they're one of the people the security team would bring in to try and get it resolved. Does that help? Cool. All right, I don't know how late we're supposed to go, but I'm guessing we're probably about done. Maybe one more question? Or else I can let you mill about in the hallway. One more question, yes. yes. Um, so I'm curious about, you know, those of us who build and play the sites kind of uh, you know, realize the best practice now is to use the composer template and kind of give up. So like, what's your opinion or what do you know about making that kind of like the de facto official way of installing Drupal 8 as far as Drupal work slash project slash so, um, so, this page, one of them. Yeah, I know. Deep down the documentation, I'm more concerned with the, you know, people who click on the download Drupal and go to the you know, main download page. It gives you the target. Correct. Right? And really, I don't think that's the best practice these days. And it kind of puts you in form of some computer model and so I'm just curious, you know, is, is there a plan that kind of Yep, that's a good question. So the question is, uh, Drupal 8 sort of ushered in this era of Composer. So for people who don't know what that is, that is uh, this project, Composer. It's a dependency manager for PHP, so it allows you to type uh, Type a set of JSON, basic usage maybe, where you can say, you know, I want to require this library of this version and various other things that you can do uh, right from the command line. You can say, I'm setting up a new project, composer require this, composer require that. You can build out one of these JSON files and then it will know to pull in exactly those versions of the modules and this kind of thing. So if you've used Drush Make to make distributions for Drupal, it's a very similar type of thing, but it, the difference is it's more generalized. It works for lots of, like, basically all modern PHP is standardizing us on the way to handle dependencies. Um, it breaks horribly when you do something like, say, download this little tarball of Drafty, uh, because if you adopt Composer, Composer really wants you to manage your whole site the Composer way. So instead of clicking and having some little tarballs over here and then Composer managing, say, the address module, which requires uh, Composer and that kind of thing. Right now, we're in this weird transition period where I wouldn't say Composer is widely adopted. The Drupal Association actually did research on this. And it was still 60 or 70% of people that are using the tarballs and building sites that way. And then there's another, uh, there's like 40% using Drush in some capacity, and of that 25% using Composer or something. So Drush 9 requires Composer now, so that will probably shift to more like a 50-50 split, but it's still far from the de facto, everyone's doing it this way, way. However, it does seem like we need to either, excuse my French, but shit or get off the pot with Composer pretty soon. <laughs> Or we're going to have like these forked, divergent ways of doing things. And it's not easy because even if you go to the page to learn about how to do this, you know, there's like three different ways, you know, and a table to decide. I mean, it's not, it's not easy. Like, it's not like the tarball approach where it's like, you have a folder, it's called modules, download the tarball, stick it in modules, you're done. You know, like, and it's, it's a lot more overhead. Because it's a generalized PHP tool, it is 
really not optimized for our use case. So it uses a lot of processing power, a lot of memory, all this kind of stuff. So we we were in this weird transition period. So what I would say about that is that the Drupal Association is involved in these talks. So the Drupal Association set up like a Drupal version of like packages to uh, like a composer front end, I think it's called. I was looking for a Drupal.org issue about this. There's a bunch of stuff in here. But at any rate, some of the things that they're talking about are uh, on the project pages, you know, right where you see the download table here, that there'd also be an entry here for like, here's the composer command to type if you're gonna do it that way. While we're in this middle weird state, the goal, though, of the automated updates uh, initiative is to actually figure out how in core to use Composer properly um, and get a, a, an API version of effectively like Drush up and Drush PMDL and these kinds of things um, in core itself working uh, seamlessly. Then build a UI on top of that because site builders still need a UI, but ideally a much better UI than the current update manager because it's kind of awful. And um, and go from there. So I would say what I can tell you is that the DA is definitely appraised of this general problem. Uh, Ryan Aslett from the DA in particular, Mixologic, has done a lot of talking not only to people in the community who use Composer extensively, like the Drupal Commerce folks, but also um, to uh, people in the Composer community, like Jordy, who is a maintainer of that project. So they're actively working on solving this problem, but I think there isn't even agreement among people who are pro-Composer on the right way to do it yet, so we're still kind of in that thrashing stage. Um, but yes, I agree with your assessment. That's definitely where things are going. Um, and we'll see more and more modules that are composer only. So more and more site builders are going to have to learn this, even if they don't want to. Um, and hopefully we can evolve the user-facing tools to the extent that they don't need to be experts in command line, because they're going to leave a lot of users behind. So, so I'll, everyone's pretty much aligned on those goals. It's figuring out the details that we're still kind of working through. So. Okay, I think I'm getting the, the cane off the stage. So thank you, everybody.